Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Doug Evans, Chair of the Department of Surgery at the Medical College of Wisconsin. And I'm here today with Dr. Carrie Peterson, and our topic is colon cancer. Carrie, thank you very much for joining me. Thank uh, you. Carrie is a graduate of the Medical College of Wisconsin Medical School. She then went west for surgical training to the University of California, San Diego. And following her complete training in surgery, along with a couple years of research, did actually two fellowships, one in colorectal surgery at Cornell in New York, and then also a fellowship in colorectal oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. We were fortunate enough to recruit her back to MCW almost three years ago now to join our division of colorectal surgery. So Carrie, maybe um, before we start on colon cancer, and I, I didn't prepare you for this, but I thought it would be good, maybe a couple words on colorectal surgery now that it is a separate board certified specialty in surgery. I think everyone heard me that you did um, all those multitude of years of general surgery to be a general surgeon and then um, uh, not one but two years of dedicated training in colorectal, but for, especially for the lay public who hears this, since colorectal surgery is now a, a separate board specialty, maybe two words on that and we'll then get to colon cancer. Right, so colorectal surgery has been a board surgery specialty for a really long time. In fact, it was one of the first um, specialty specific surgery boards. And it really grew out of um, proctology as well in an attempt to try and standardize and improve the quality of patient care, you know, 50, 70 years ago. Um, but it's a practice that really focuses on GI and problems of the colon, rectum, and anus. So in addition to colon cancer, which is something I treat a lot and see a lot of, I also see rectal cancer. And we treat a number of benign diseases like diverticulitis, which is an infection of the colon, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, and then a variety of anorectal problems, hemorrhoids, fissures, fistulas, and sometimes some even really complicated things that many other surgical specialties never see. So, you know, tailbone cysts would be one of those things. Um, fecal incontinence would be another as well. Sure. So it's a, a really interesting specialty with a huge variety, um, and it's enough to keep you very interested. It's, it's wonderful. And I think it's been dedicated a specialty really due to the complexity of it. Correct. And the fact mm -hmm. that it's, it's really hard to be, have a practice that is, that is focused on, on everything that's new and innovative in colorectal surgery and also taking care of trauma Right. Inguinal hernias. I mean, it's just, it becomes almost impossible, right? Right, absolutely. So colon cancer uh, affects nearly 10% of all Americans, uh, often treated, virtually almost always treated with uh, surgery. And what operations do you do? How is surgery inter interdigitated with other therapies? And what does the patient need to know who, who has a new diagnosis of colon cancer? Right, so I often see patients after they've had a colonoscopy and a biopsy that's shown uh, colon cancer. This is the, the most typical scenario. And surgery is right now the only treatment that allows any cure um, for colorectal cancer. There are some chemotherapies that we give after surgery, and sometimes we use radiation if tumors have come back or if there's rectal cancer tumors in the pelvis. Um, but for the vast majority of colon cancer patients, surgery is the primary treatment to get the tumor out and to remove the lymph nodes that drain the colon. And that's how we stage colon cancer. If it's just um, refined to the colon wall itself, it's either a stage one or a stage two. And if it's spread to the lymph nodes, it's a stage three cancer. And that's when we give chemotherapy after surgery. The type of surgery we do primarily depends on where the tumor is located, whether it's in the right side of the colon near the appendix or the left side of the colon um, by the sigmoid colon. Um, both of those surgeries are considered a major operation for patients. They're, they're a pretty significant undertaking. Um, they always require a stay in the hospital of anywhere from three to seven days, depending on the <clears throat> extent of the surgery. Um, and a significant recovery at home. It's usually a few weeks before patients are really kind of feeling back to themselves. Yeah. Now, uh, is colon cancer not preventable? I mean, if you, if everyone, if the whole world were to get colonoscopies, would it be preventable, or still would there be still would a few people get colon cancer? What's the story with all that? And yeah. I know the whole world listening to this, you know, doesn't want to do the prep for the colonoscopy, so. Right. Should they, should they not? 
We actually think colon cancer is about 90% preventable with a wow. colonoscopy and polypectomy. So the vast majority of people could have it prevented. There's always going to be people that colon polyps and cancers develop either before the recommended age or who have a genetic predisposition or some exposure that might have set them on a pathway for developing cancer sooner or faster than the typical mm. patient. But yeah, the majority could be prevented with colonoscopy. There are other screening alternatives. There are a number of stool tests that are available that test for either blood or a newer test that tests for DNA markers. As you can imagine, while they're relatively convenient because it simply involves taking a stool sample and sending it to a lab, any positive test needs to be followed up with a colonoscopy to really get a firm diagnosis. Uh, yeah, so. Sure, wow. Um, are there ways to make colon surgery less painful and enhance recovery? I mean, I would say that not only your group, but the field of board certified colorectal surgeons has really led the effort um, in surgery in general across mm -hmm. the country in trying to develop protocols and pathways mm -hmm. to make the operation easier for the patient and to enhance recovery. I, I mean, a huge, uh, huge thank you to you and your specialty for doing this for all of us. But maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. Over the last five, ten years, um, colorectal surgery, as you said, has really led the way in trying to develop a plan of care for patients that helps to minimize a few things that we think are really I don't want to say detrimental, but can be really have a significant impact on patients. So um, choosing minimally invasive surgical strategies versus an open, large incision strategy whenever possible. You know, uh, minimally invasive surgery, whether it's laparoscopic or robotic surgery, has been associated with improved recovery times, less pain, shorter hospital stays, and fewer complication rates. So anytime we can favor those techniques, um, we are benefiting patients. We do other strategies, one of which is to minimize narcotics. So narcotic opiate-based pain medications have a number of complications. The most significant would be you know, depressing breathing after surgery, but they also depress the function of the GI system. And that delays patients' recovery pretty significantly. As many as 20% of patients can have that problem after surgery. They stay in the hospital longer. They can't eat. Um, they have all sorts of issues related to that. So we use a number of strategies as far as regional pain um, approaches, medications, to try and limit the amount of narcotics patients get. It's not that their pain is out of control. It's we favor other alternatives sure. instead of choosing narcotics that have a better pro uh, side effect profile. Certainly a tremendous emphasis right now on minimizing pain in the hospital setting in general. Right. And I think mm -hmm. at, a, at a big place like this, there is an intense focus. The nurses, uh, virtually everyone involved in making sure that, that, that pain is well managed. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things I do for my patients is have everyone see um, one of our anesthesiologists the morning of surgery. And they do either an epidural, which is a small catheter that goes in the back to drip pain medicines on the nerves, or a block on either side to make the nerves that go to the belly numb. So when patients wake up, they have less pain after surgery because those nerves are numb. Sure. And I have a number of people who tell me that it really makes a big difference. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, one of the things that has been touted to make, uh, make the operation a, a little bit easier to recover from is either laparoscopy mm -hmm. or now the robot. And mm -hmm. um, I think many of the lay public have heard that there's a robot in the operating room. They're not sure if the robot is actually doing the operation <laughs> or you're doing it, but maybe you can tell us what the role of um, laparoscopy and the, and the robot uh, yeah. is in colorectal surgery. Yeah, so the robotic surgery has been a new technique that's been around for probably about 20 years. Made a lot of headway in prostate surgery for operating in the pelvis. And the reason is when you operate in the pelvis, it's sort of like operating inside a very small funnel. And it becomes very difficult not only to get your hands down in there, but to get other instruments down in there as well. And the robot has a huge advantage because it has a number of wrists that allow the instruments to maneuver in a way that's similar to your hands, but of course it's the size of my finger. So it's much smaller um, and much more maneuverable. So it's really taken off in colorectal surgery in the last probably 10 years. 
particularly for rectal cancer surgery. So the well. arms of the robot are just put in through the abdominal wall? Through the abdominal wall. The abdomen is insufflated just like in laparoscopy, and then we use those arms to reach down into the pelvis or any other place in the abdomen and do our surgery that way. And then you, t you are basically you are the robot. I am the robot, exactly. It is a, it's a slave situation. The robot doesn't do anything that I don't tell it to do. Yeah, so, fascinating, yeah. great. Yeah, it is very interesting, yeah. Well, I think we may spend the last couple minutes on, um, on this video focused on uh, patient safety. Mm -hmm. I think right now there's a tremendous emphasis appropriately on doing uh, all aspects of medicine as efficiently and safely as humanly possible, and Dr. Peterson, is uh, our depart one of our department patient safety and quality officers. Our Department of Surgery numbers uh, now almost 100 faculty members and therefore having a dedicated focus on making sure that everything we do is complication free and done as, as safely um, and as uh, efficiently and caring as possible is now a huge focus and yeah, you're one of the absolutely. people leading this effort. Maybe you can kind of explain this uh, a little bit so that patients know that, you know, people who spend uh, all of their time uh, focused on uh, diseases of the colon and rectum also are trying to do it as, as safely as possible. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the trouble with medicine is um, it's not a perfect system and the human body isn't a perfect machine. And so things happen and sometimes we can explain them and sometimes we have trouble doing that. So what the Patient Safety and Quality Initiative is really sort of trying to do is understand why things happen after surgery, before surgery, during surgery, and understand are there ways that we can identify and prevent them in the future, um, and look for ways we can overall improve the process of medical care as well as any individual interaction. So we have a number of strategies that we do. We review um, all of our outcomes after surgery, so patients that get blood transfusions, patients that um, have blood clots, for example, or pneumonias, all of those cases are reviewed so that we can identify trends and look for ways that we can improve the care that we deliver. And then we typically discuss them at a weekly conference. Absolutely. Not only do we discuss them at our departmental weekly conference, but we also have a number of quality improvement um, review process that occur behind the scenes and in addition to that weekly conference as well. And you know that cross-pollination between specialties is just mm -hmm. so important. Just this week, mm -hmm. you know, there was a, there was a uh, issue of, um, as you, you already brought up, an, the, an issue of a blood clot in a patient's leg. Mm -hmm. It happened to be a patient who um, uh, was quite large, and the perspective of our bariatric surgeons, the surgeons who specialize in weight loss reducing surgery, was just so critically important mm -hmm. to add insight into, uh, into, uh, in, into the management of that problem in areas that had nothing to do with bariatric surgery. Yeah. So I think uh, all of this is just so important. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so much medical information out there. No one person can be an expert in everything anymore. And so having um, colleagues who are specialists in areas that I am not, like bariatric surgery, for example, um, is absolutely critical to be able to get the right information so we know, know the ways that we can improve. Yeah, great. Sure. Well, Carrie, thank you so much. And if the, for those of you who would like more information on Dr. Peterson or colorectal surgery, uh, just stay tuned. You will see uh, the contact information for her uh, to follow. Thank you all very much for joining us. Carrie, thank you again. Thank you for having me. Okay.